Our next um, speaker is Professor Shlomo Berkowski. Um, Shlomo, Shlomo leads the um, stream on precision health. He's a computer scientist, has expertise in human-centric applications of AI and machine learning. Um, Shlomo has experience both across um, academia as well as industry. Thanks, Shlomo. Thank you, Farah. Thanks for the intro. Uh, so I'm Shlomo, and I lead the, the Precision Health stream uh, of the center. Uh, I'll overview very briefly what we do and where we think uh, this will go in the coming years. Uh, so first of all, yeah, acknowledgement to all the members of the stream, all those people who basically come in front of me and they do the work. Uh, you have a list of people here. I won't be reading the names. Um, what we do in a nutshell is, is a combination of AI, artificial intelligence, and human health. Now, if you pause and think about it for a second, this combination is, is far from trivial because on the one hand, we have, we have the machines. We have the AI, which is about empowering the machine, uh, making it more autonomous, making it, uh, allowing it to deal with more challenging tasks. So it's all about the machines. On the other hand, we have human health, which is a very human-centric area, right? It's, it's human data, it's uh, human looking after human. Um, so it's all about human. So well, you know, there, there is a big question here of how actually these two areas come together, how they coexist peacefully, how can we develop technology that will help this, this human-centric um, sort of human-centric area, area of work, area of research. And then another point that I would like to make here is, you know, I'm a computer scientist, so I'm coming from computing background, and computing technologies, information technologies, they can be, they can work in a whole range of domains, like, you know, you can think of Netflix uh, and, and recommending, Netflix recommending new movies to watch. There is IT behind it. There is AI behind it. You can think of, of a self-driving Tesla, obviously AI behind it, right? And you can think of medical AI, uh, which, which is another application of AI. Like if you compare these three examples, clearly the last one is probably the most impactful out of the three and probably one of the most Im impactful overall because you know, that's where the technology comes to the front, and that's where the technology can improve quality of life or, um, you know, save lives, to be more dramatic. Uh, so, so I think overall, you know, it's, it's a very interesting area to work on. It's, it's a very timely area, and Rico talked about this, about the evolution of AI, evolution of technologies in the last 10 years. And um, so, yeah, thanks a lot for allowing us to do this work, for, 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 for having us. Um, so the, yeah. uh, so the work that we do, it can be broadly partitioned into these uh, three streams, precision health, uh, physiological predictors, and human technology interaction. I'll overview each one of them with, with a few sample projects that we do, uh, going very, very broadly, sort of very high level overview of those projects, just hoping to communicate the problem I'm not going to talk about how we do it, how we solve it, so just the problem and in one sentence the, the results that we have achieved. Uh, so let's start with precision health. Precision health, it, it is what I've been talking about so far. It's about the application of AI, machine learning, deep learning, whatever you call this automation technology, this, this machinery that goes under the hood, about the application of this technology to precision health and to helping uh, with uh, medical problems in health and medicine. So several examples, two, three examples for each of these areas. Uh, first, we, we have a joint collaborative project with the Melanoma Institute uh, where they would like to be able and predict uh, the response of patient to immunotherapy treatment. So it's a very new treatment, super effective treatment, but approximately half of the people who receive this treatment end up in ICU not because of their melanoma condition, but because of the treatment that they received. Uh, 
the side effects of the treatment. And as of now, the clinicians, they, they just cannot predict. They are not able to say whether, whether the person will respond to the treatment or whether this person will be uh, in ICU in a few days' time. Uh, so what, what we are doing in this project, we are trying to look at uh, genomic information, genome sequencing of these patients in order to predict this. We, we are developing machine learning that would allow us to, to predict this. Uh, in short, it's a very challenging problem. Uh, we're not doing that well, and the, and the reason is that the computational side of the problem is indeed very difficult. It's, it's a very long genome with, you know, tens of millions of potential predictors of bits of information, and each of these, uh, you know, there are not that many patients. Uh, the sequencing is expensive on its own, so it's not easy to collect enough information and develop this uh, accurate and predictive machine learning. So that, that's really a challenging problem. We, we're, we're working on this, uh, and there is a lot of work in front of us. Uh, changing gear, totally different area, totally different problem. Um, there are online screening tools, online questionnaires that uh, help uh, predict, help detect uh, anxiety disorders in kids. So those, those questionnaires are usually filled out by the parents, uh, and then on the basis of these questionnaires, uh, the clinicians would, would schedule diagnostic interviews. Um, noisy information because it's filled out about parents, it's filled out by parents, it's about their kids, um, some information is imprecise. Uh, that said, uh, can we actually somehow apply machine learning and detect which kids actually have those anxiety disorders? The answer is yes, we did it with a reasonably high accuracy. Uh, we identified the most predictive questions in this questionnaire. We learned how to fuse all this information. Uh, we did it for three anxiety disorders where we had enough data to actually develop this machine learning, uh, but we reached pretty good results. Uh, pretty accurate predictions. Again, another completely different area, um, COVID. Um, this was about lung CT. It was actually pretty early work, I think. We, we got the data in early 2020, early mid-2020, we got the data from several hospitals in China, uh, and we developed predictive models that uh, allowed us to predict the severity of the disease at diagnosis time. So essentially, very early stage of the disease where people are just diagnosed with COVID, we were able to predict whether the progression of the disease will be mild and these people will, will be discharged in, in a couple of days and stay at home, or whether they'll need uh, ventilators and they'll stay in hospital for a couple of weeks. Uh, again, um, pretty good accuracy with, with severity assessment, uh, but still there is some work to do in um, in progression predictions, and again, I'm, I'm pretty proud to say that this was one of the first papers, one of the first works that talked about lung CT for COVID predictions because we managed to obtain the data pretty early. Uh, jumping to the second stream of work, uh, human technology interaction. I've just been talking about this, this amazing AI that can do incredible predictions that can predict things that human doctors cannot predict or cannot tell ahead of time as early as AI can. But then the next question is, okay, we have this incredible machinery. How can we make this machinery usable? How can we make this information meaningful? How can we communicate it in a good way? How can we actually help the workflow of the clinicians? So all these I put under the banner of uh, human technology interaction, how to improve clinician and patient interaction with health technologies. Uh, two projects that I would like to highlight. Uh, one of them is, is uh, automated decision support that Farah just mentioned in her presentation. Uh, slightly different form of decision support here. We talk about radiology, again, an area where decision support is making huge steps forward. Um, when you have this extra pair of eyes helping the radiologist to decide about, uh, about uh, in this case, we have broken, broken extremities, so I think you have somewhere in the middle like a suggestion saying fractured or not fractured. Uh, but actually, the machine is not 100% correct. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's wrong, and the human clinician, the human doctor will often rely on this suggestion. So how does the trust and reliance depend on the performance of the machine? on the accuracy of the machine, right? Again, AI can be as perfect as it gets, but sometimes, 
perfect. Well, sometimes it goes wrong, and then how do these mistakes affect the uptake of this automated decision support? Uh, so what, what we know so far, we've conducted a study, we've collected the data, and we actually see that uh, human clinicians, they, they are pretty good at picking up the accuracy, at perceiving the accuracy of the machine, and they calibrate their trust, they calibrate their reliance on the machine accordingly, they're pretty good at managing this, um, this interaction. Uh, another area is uh, privacy and security. And here we particularly focused on, uh, on mobile health applications, on mobile apps, in short. They collect a lot of personal data, often sensitive data. What do they do with this data? Does it leak? Where to? Uh, do their behavior, does it actually align, does their behavior align with what they tell in their privacy disclosure um, documents in that? long form that nobody ever reads. So we, we've conducted a large scale, we've conducted an analysis of about 20,000 apps on, on Google Play Store. Of course, it was all automated, 20,000. We couldn't do it manually. Uh, and, and we discovered quite a lot of issues here. So for example, um, about 25% of apps violate their own privacy policies. Uh, about 25% of apps, not the same 25%, but the same number of apps, uh, use outdated and insecure communication protocol protocols to, to send their data, often sensitive. Um, yeah. Uh, and the last area is uh, physiological predictors. Uh, so this area is actually a, a merger of uh, sensing technologies and signal processing technologies. And the big question that we deal here is how we can use sensors and signal processing, signal processing to detect or predict medical condition. For example, neurological conditions, and we have technologies like EEG or MEG that can capture, capture tiny you know, electric and magnetic signals and changes occurring in the brain. So can we leverage these signals to predict uh, neurological conditions? So that's, that's in fact one of the projects that we are working on. Uh, we are working with, uh, with, a, with, a, with a Parkinson's clinician and trying to predict freezing of gait, which is one of, one of the common symptoms in, in Parkinson's, uh, using EEG data, using these tiny electric signals that uh, EEG headset can, can capture. Um, again, here, the accuracy, we, we are sort of approaching good levels of accuracy, but again, it's, it's a pretty challenging problem. There is a lot of data, a lot of signal that's captured at different frequency bands, uh, different channels of the EEG headset, uh, and it's really hard to, to single out those predictive bits of information that actually would allow us to answer this question. And another question, another project going back to the COVID space, uh, we, these days we have sensors and we have sensing technologies in every mobile phone. So can we, you know, we don't need this ex expensive uh, EEG headset to actually capture the information. We have very common technologies that are in every pocket that can capture the information. So can we, for example, here the question that we try to answer, uh, can we screen COVID uh, using mobile phones? And in this case, we intended to use two technologies, the audio recordings of coughs uh, and the blood pulsation data that we can capture with, uh, with the camera that you see on the right. We ended up doing only the left-hand side, only the coughs, uh, but uh, we, got pretty good classification accuracy, um, which is a potential for sort of large screen, large scale, uh, population scale screening using mobile technologies. Uh, so these are the three streams uh, that we are currently active in, and I would like to take the, the remaining couple of minutes and just to talk about where I see this, this area going. So one sort of promising potential area is a combination of machine learning and uh, of AI and machine learning with sensing technologies. And, and probably that, that COVID project was, was sort of a good example of very common, very cheap, not very precise sensors and technologies that are everywhere. That, you know, we have cameras, we have microphones, uh, we have we have EEG headsets that, that are getting as cheap as, as hundreds of dollars, right? So how can these simple and not medical grade devices that are very common, or they can be very common, 
how can these be used to, to detect and predict uh, various conditions. Now, th there are two things here. One is this ubiquity of, of the sensors and devices that are available everywhere, and the other thing is obviously the, the computational power. We have all those amazing cloud computing technologies, uh, so that we, we have the computational power of mobile phone itself, which is probably comparable to, to, to a mid-level computer just, just 10 years ago, for example. Uh, so when we combine these two things, when they come together, the, the sensors are everywhere, and we can collect data everywhere, and then the computational technology, there are some things that are in the pockets, and there are some huge, very powerful things that are in the cloud. When we combine these two things together, where can we take it? And the other area which, again, I find pretty interesting is, uh, is a combination of AI and, and this human technology interaction. Again, at the moment, there is a lot of focus on AI, on developing this computational power that would allow us to predict things, to detect things, but then I can take it back. Okay, this technology is gonna be used by a human user, be it the patient, be it the clinician, but the information will go back to the human. And, and they'll be using this information. They'll be making decision on, decisions on the basis of this information. So how to communicate these decisions, how to communicate this support, how to make it usable, and all those things that you, that you see over there in the slides, like explainability of the technology, natural language interaction, can I talk, just like I'm talking to Siri today, can I talk to a medical decision support in the same fashion? Uh, how do I make this technology usable? How do I visualize information and communicate it in a way that would be most convenient, most usable for the, for the patient? Again, matters around security and privacy. So essentially, yes, take this AI, that there is a lot of effort and lots of teams all over the world trying to develop the AI and now put it in the hands of real user, implementation science if you wish, but how do we actually make it usable and valuable in practice? Uh, so that's the last area and that's it. Thank you.